Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my presentation, A New Perspective on Insulin Sensitivity, Insights from a Hybrid Neural Network. Before we get started, I do have a couple of disclosures. I have filed preliminary U.S. patent applications on some of the stuff uh, covered here, uh, but I am offering it royalty-free license for personal non-commercial use. So everybody in the We Are Not Waiting community, go for it. Do with this what you will. Uh, this is really the uh, crux of the research that I did, basically that people who live with diabetes know what dose they need uh, in given situations just through years and years of experience. And uh, this actually provides some insights that we can use to inform our healthcare professionals. Uh, a little bit about who I am. Uh, my name is Chris Wilson. I'm on the admin team for multiple uh, type 1 diabetes Facebook groups, uh, primarily device focused. I've had 24 years of experience living with type 1 diabetes uh, and I've been working professionally in information technology for about 30 years, uh, most recently focusing on databases and architecting cloud systems, uh, but I've also worked on developing open standards for exchange of recreational water quality data as part of an international team with regulatory agencies and NGOs. I also uh, built the interactive music system and lighting controls for AOL's home of the 21st century back in the early 2000s. Uh, and I am a frequent clinical trial participant, uh, including having been in the Dexcom G6 acetaminophen challenge trial and the phase three trial for the Xeris GVOC. Uh, one of the things that uh, is always fun to do is new research, not just confirming things that we already know, and so that's what I wanted to do here. And Focusing on insulin sensitivity, we know that it's not static. We know that as your blood glucose goes up, uh, insulin is less effective. So I wanted to look at this, and to do that, I asked the diabetes online community, how do you dose when you're doing corrections? Uh, specifically, I asked a question, given a target blood sugar, how much of a correction dose would you give based on all of your years of experience and knowledge living with type 1 diabetes and at various blood glucose levels? And then I calculated back what the effective insulin sensitivity factor was that people were using to uh, arrive at these doses, even if they don't know it in their minds themselves. And really, it's uh, about the vibes. Uh, we joke about dosing based on vibes, nailing a bolus for something that we don't know how much the carb count is. But those vibes actually have validity. Uh, what they are is the outputs of our, the neural networks in our brains that we've spent years training, whether we like it or not. So uh, this is the data that I collected, uh, displayed just in two dimensions, uh, total daily dose versus insulin sensitivity factor. Uh, and I've overlaid a line on there with the 1800 rule that's currently used uh, for setting insulin sensitivity factors in insulin pumps, at least initially. Uh, this is from a group of about 50 people. Uh, the age range is 2 to 75, total daily doses between 8 and 125 units a day. The big thing that stands out in the sample, at least from the demographic data that I did collect, is that it is 75% female, which probably introduces some extra noise into what we're seeing here. But when we stretch this data out and we look at it in three dimensions, uh, it's clear that uh, there is actually a pattern underlying what looks like noise when it's only looked at in two dimensions. A lot of that stuff that looks like noisy data really isn't. There's uh, structure underneath it. So I took all of this and I fed it into a simple neural network, uh, trained it over a thousand iterations across this data, uh, and then fed known inputs into the neural network and looked at the outputs to determine the underlying mathematical function. Here is the result of this. Uh, it, it's an approximation, uh, but it appears to work very well, at least in the testing that's been done so far. Uh, this is not the actual current insulin sensitivity because that changes minute to minute, but it's the average over the duration of the insulin action. And it's actually the fact that our insulins are so slow that allows this to work. 
but it also explains the dosing differences that we see with insulins that are super fast, like a Fresa inhaled insulin, uh, where the insulin has its effect before the body actually has a time to adjust insulin sensitivity. Really, I know Dune's hot right now, uh, but this holds true when we're thinking about diabetes. You can't understand something just by looking at it as a snapshot in time. Uh, the, it needs to be constantly reevaluated so that our understanding can move with the flow of the process. And when we look at the individual uh, total daily dose curves, if we sort of flatten them all together, uh, what we see is that it's actually the inflection point of the uh, of the graph that shifts, and the whole line shifts. So uh, the slopes of all of these lines are all different, and uh, this is probably what has made uh, determining overall insulin sensitivity so hard in the past. Is that the rule changes depending on the individual where you're doing the experimentation. Uh, interactions with our current dosing regimens, looking at this. Uh, the function that I presented earlier uh, intersects with the 1800 rule line at a blood glucose of about 154 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, that is about where we tell people to test, so that actually makes sense. Uh, Many uh, users of Control IQ crank up that insulin sensitivity factor uh, and only correcting at about 60% of the correction dose, uh, which is what we know the algorithm does, actually uh, brings it down to close to the dose required if someone has set their insulin sensitivity factor more aggressively. And we can look at this comparing the, the recommended doses given uh, based on the 1800 rule. That's the straight black line here. Uh, it actually adheres very, very closely to uh, the line given by this function. But then as blood glucose gets higher and higher and higher and people need more and more corrections, there's actually a very significant divergence, which explains why people get stuck at higher blood glucose levels. Uh, and get frustrated and wind up eventually rage bolusing and crashing. Uh, we've actually been testing this. Uh, Tim Street has been uh, very kind in uh, assisting with uh, looking at implementation. He shared some initial results from his preliminary testing back in July of this year. Uh, there's a link to the uh, blog post. It's towards the end uh, that, that he discusses this. Uh, but he saw about 90% time in range in uh, some of his initial testing, and uh, he wasn't easy on the algorithm by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but this is also no user intervention, so the fact that he is very good at his blood glucose management uh, shouldn't really have been a factor in here. So, as I said, uh, implementation in OpenEPS and its sort of descendant uh, systems. Uh, Tim's been helping with uh, testing and refinement. He's using the total daily dose input calculated as a weighted seven-day average. Uh, that's actually not what I'm doing. I'm just using yesterday's uh, total daily insulin use, uh, but both systems seem to work reasonably well. Uh, Tim has roughly 30 people walking around with uh, closed loop systems using this right now. Uh, it has a key benefit in that you don't need to adjust insulin sensitivity in the pump profile as the insulin needs change. And he's uh, reporting that people are seeing time in range of about 85%, although there has not yet been any formal data collection on this. Uh, these are my results using it sort of on top of control IQ, uh, adjusting the uh, various modes that the uh, algorithm can operate in to get it to behave more closely to what this new math says that it should. Uh, this is 90 day report, uh, includes lots of big insulin sensitivity shifts due to uh, experimental meds that I've been on. Uh, but this 94% time and range uh, is actually a improvement from the baseline, which at the beginning of this year was about 88%. So we've actually cut highs in half and almost no readings below 70 at all. Uh, 
to do this? What did I use? Uh, most of the stuff is free. It didn't really cost a whole lot of money. It just took a bunch of my time. Uh, I did all the data collection with Google Forms, uh, organizing and collating the data in Google Sheets, JASP, which is free statistical analysis software for the Mac. Uh, TensorFlow is free software. I did uh, rent an Amazon machine learning instance to uh, run the analysis on for a total cost of 11 cents. Uh, and there's a couple of other uh, tools that I use that are either free or very, very low cost as well. But cost is not a, a major issue to doing this kind of uh, research. And really, uh, when we think about what this means for the we are not waiting community at large, uh, it means that we can gain insights from, ta from tapping the hive mind that we have in the diabetes online community. We've got lots of individuals that are out there running daily experiments on themselves, uh, refining their doses, uh, figuring out what works and what doesn't. Um, but those vibes, the outputs of the biological neural nets, we can then combine into a meta-analysis of their output and use that to discern useful insights. Even if the data are noisy, uh, we can sort of overcome that noise with uh, sufficient quantity to identify underlying patterns. One of the big things I think that this presents an opportunity for is focusing on unknown knowns, uh, things that we know but may not even realize that we know, and contrasting those to things that we know that we know, the known knowns, the known unknowns, the things that we know that we don't know, and then even farther out, the unknown unknowns, the things that we don't know that we don't know. But really, it's this fourth category that presents an opportunity to gain new insights as to uh, how diabetes interacts with our bodies. Let me zoom in a little bit more. Uh, if this relationship between blood glucose and insulin sensitivity holds, as it appears to, at least so far, uh, and I will note that, yeah, we've got the, the numerator uh, of 277700, uh, 277,700. Uh, that's what the neural net determined. It's probably not exact. It is very close to E times 10 to the fifth, uh, which shows up in a lot of functions used to describe biological processes. Uh, but we've still got open questions. Uh, does the carb factor scale like the correction factor does, and do basals affect things? Uh, does this numerator change slightly if someone has a different basal bolus ratio than roughly 50-50 that seems to be the standard assumption? Uh, but regardless of that, it does give us at least a mathematical framework with which we can evaluate glycemic impacts, basically flipping the traditional insulin clamp where we're infusing glucose to match the insulin on its head, where we're now infusing insulin to match the glucose. But mathematically, assuming we have accurate tracking of the insulin on board and blood glucose over time, uh, we can calculate and evaluate uh, the effects of that insulin and therefore the effects of the glycemic impacts of whatever it's countering uh, to enable fully remote studies if we can capture all of this data. Um, we already have great CGM data. It's getting better. Uh, I have yet to find an easy way to record uh, constant IOB in five minute increments, although I'm sure somebody's got this data somewhere. Uh, if not, it can probably be recalculated from the insulin delivery data and then monitored over time. But thinking about this, uh, what if we could actually run a study that looked at how to successfully dose for pizza? What is the most successful strategy? Uh, similarly, what about beer? Uh, things that we would not necessarily study in a clinical setting, uh, but that people do encounter in the real world and do make real differences in people's control of their diabetes. Uh, obviously, we need ways to organize, co collate, and normalize the data. Uh, 
binary or probability based outcomes work better. Uh, neural nets really like percentages. If things can be reduced to percentages, that makes the analysis that much easier. Uh, but the ultimate question is, is there an underlying pattern underneath whatever it is that we're looking at that a neural network can find? So uh, prerequisites to sort of make this all work. Uh, obviously, we need the accurate real-time blood glucose data. We also need accurate insulin on board calculations and curves. Uh, I've been using eight hours with uh, standard Lispro insulin. Uh, Tim Street has been using a seven-hour curve with uh, Lumgev, the uh, even faster Lispro. Uh, obviously, we need volunteers who are willing to provide data and then the data analysis and collection capacity. Um, we also probably need to think about what are the problems that we need to, to solve. We can obviously identify priorities through surveys, but uh, if it's not something we can measure, uh, then there's not a whole lot we can do there. Uh, but if we can identify problems where there are underlying patterns and that will make a difference in the lives of people who live with diabetes, uh, th this is someplace where we can actually have a real impact. Um, it would be nice to have support from industry and academia, uh, either advisory boards to help sort of guide the research and let us know where we're doing things right and wrong. Uh, underwriting of analysis tools and software uh, or providing uh, IRB review such that this the results of anything that we do can actually be published in peer-reviewed journals. Um, and then also any neural networks or machine learning uh, capacity that they have to uh, help us tease out the patterns because the data from this will obviously continue to be noisy. But the upshot here is that, yes, when you live with type 1 diabetes, every day of your life is, in fact, a science experiment. Uh, we just need to record uh, what we're doing and what the results are, and then from there, figure out a way to quantify it, analyze the data in mass, and actually extract meaningful insights from it. Thank you. Uh, thanks for paying attention. Uh, I want to send a big thank out. Thank you to uh, Amy and the whole team at Diabetes Mine. Uh, obviously, Tim Street, uh, who has helped with uh, testing and, and uh, implementation of this. I'm sure he'll be sharing details shortly. Uh, numerous clinicians, endocrinologists uh, that I've bounced ideas off of and talked about uh, this stuff with over uh, a number of years. Uh, and obviously the Greater Diabetes Online community for uh, providing the data, uh, giving me access to the outputs of their neural networks uh, so that we can uh, do this analysis. And now it's time for Q&A. Thanks, everyone.